this webcast sponsored by Energy Cap, navigating the journey to financial grade carbon accounting. I'm Nico McCrossin, Sustainable Finance and ESG Manager at GreenBiz, and I'm thrilled to welcome all of our listeners tuning in around the world. Before we begin, a few housekeeping details. This webcast platform has a number of features I'd like to point out. As shown on the slide, you can resize and move around the various windows on the webcast platform to optimize your viewing experience. On the bottom of your screen, there is a toolbar with various buttons. You can download the resources from today's webcast by clicking on the button marked Resources. Note, this webcast is being recorded and the recording will be shared with all registrants later today. If you have any questions for today's speakers, simply click on the Q&A button and type your questions into the Q&A window that appears. We'll be fielding those later on in this program, but don't hesitate to ask along the way. You can also chat with other attendees at any time by clicking the group chat button. Finally, feel free to share what you're learning today with your tw Twitter network by using the hashtag GRNBZ. That's GreenBiz without the vowels. And now on to today's discussion. What is financial grade carbon accounting? Why does it matter? And what can you do to prepare? In order for society to mitigate the most disruptive effects of climate change, greenhouse gas emissions must be reduced significantly. Companies who fail to act to reduce their emissions run the risk of being unprepared for increases in climate related regulations known as transition risks. This one hour interactive webcast will provide insights about the complexity of carbon accounting, demonstrate why financial grade emissions data is essential for businesses, and show you how your organization can move forward on its decarbonization journey. Joining me today are Lalit Agarwal, Vice President of Energy Management and Sustainability at Energy Cap, Dave Ulmer, Chief Product and Technology Officer at Energy Cap and Matthew Charon, Vice President of Lobo Energy. Thank you all for joining us today. And now I'll pass it to Lolit to start the discussion. Thank you, Nico. I uh, appreciate that introduction. And uh, as you pointed out, uh, the, the, the imperative to make sure that we are doing everything we can to make sure that we keep our planet sustainable is very important. Uh, just as a quick background about the company, Energy Cap has been in business for uh, 40 years. And it has uh, done a lot of uh, work in trying to take the client's energy and sustainability data and convert it into uh, manageable consumption to help reduce carbon and drive savings. Uh, just quick statistics at the bottom there. We have 10,000 plus energy and sustainability users. We process about $17 billion worth of vendor bills. And we have verified annual savings of more than $500 million. And we do this all through a, a suite of products, which we term energy and sustainability ERP. And when we think about ERP, the first question that comes about is what is an ERP? So an ERP uh, is defined as a comprehensive software package that is used by companies or institutions to streamline and coordinate operations and activities across business functions. You're probably familiar with a human resource ERP or an accounting ERP. So and uh, energy and sustainability ERP is uh, about uh, the same way. Um, so if you think about how uh, we started using um, uh, information tracking, we usually have always moved from spreadsheets to an ERP-like solution, whether it's the HR solution that we use or the accounting solution. So typically on the status quo side, you have manual data entry, and it usually is occurring um, on a periodic basis, not not continuously, the data that you put in is difficult to access, manual labor, all those uh, challenges that you have. But when you when you switch over to a, a modern ERP system and using uh, technology to help solve your problems, you can automate all those uh, data capture, you can make it um, auditable, you can uh, update that information in real time, uh, reduce or eliminate manual labor, and, uh, improve collaboration. And the biggest thing that you get is that that proactivity of having to having the ability to monitor and respond to your data in real time. Um, so that's what EnergyCap does. It's a single platform for the entire team. 
it brings together the uh, the members of your energy utilities team with sustainability and even the financial team that is responsible for making sure that the demands of energy accounting, which is a complicated world, uh, it allows them to come together and capture, allocate, analyze, and report the data in the way they want it. So that's uh, a little bit about our company and the software solution, and Dave later is gonna go uh, further deep into how each of those elements work. Um, but we are talking today about carbon accounting. So before we go too far, we wanted to make sure that we can talk about ABCs of greenhouse gases. And really, I uh, would have really loved to term this as one, two, threes of uh, uh, greenhouse gases because that's how the greenhouse gas protocol defines uh, these GHGs. It's in scope one, scope two, or scope three. So these greenhouse gases, they go in the atmosphere and they trap the heat that would have otherwise escaped back into the space uh, from the sun. And these, uh, these are uh, typically commonly carbon dioxide, methane, nitrous oxide, along with some uh, fluorocarbons and sulfur hexafluoride. So if you burn any fossil fuel on your site uh, and that results in a greenhouse gas like natural gas or uh, coal and it goes into the atmosphere, you are directly responsible for that emission uh, getting trapped into the atmosphere. So those are called the scope one direct emissions. So those are if you're using any heating uh, uh, elements on your company or even your company fleet is considered part of scope one. So this is just a way of classifying these uh, 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 greenhouse gases. But if you choose to uh, uh, buy services from outside, so instead of having a boiler on your site and burning that natural gas, if you if you purchase steam from a district energy provider, then you could claim that, hey, we are not burning anything but you are still bypassing the, uh, not bypassing, you're, you're kind of putting the load of burning the natural gas uh, to the district energy provider. So those are considered scope through, scope two or indirect gas emissions. So you are purchasing energy from somebody else and they are burning the fossil fuels on your behalf. The interesting thing about these uh, scope one, scope two, and scope three classification also is uh, from whose point of view are you talking about? So from uh, in the previous example, if the, the district energy provider is producing uh, steam or hot water to provide you as a company, from their point of view, the natural gas they burned is scope one. But from your point of view, it's scope two because you're purchasing that steam. So those are two very easy to understand because they are most, uh, they have been around for a long period of time and those are directly related to energy that we consume in terms of uh, electrification, heating and cooling and transportation. But then it comes to this whole new level of scope three uh, uh, emissions that greenhouse gas protocol defines. And those are the indirect emissions that are uh, released into the atmosphere because of us doing business. Uh, so anything that is on the upstream side, which is goods and services, business travel, waste generated and op operation, those are classified as scope three in indirect emissions meaning that if we run our operation a little more efficiently, we would be consuming a lot less of them and we would be impacting less in the environment. And so uh, on the downstream side of it, once our products and goods are completed and once they go out into the market, all the emissions associated with those, for example, sending our material through uh, distribution channels to our customers or through warehouses, through stores, those are all counted towards scope three emissions. So if you really want to get an overall picture of what your impact as your organization, as your company's impact on our environment is, you need to make sure that you take all three scopes into the consideration. So that's just a very quick primer on greenhouse gases here. Uh, so the question then becomes, so we do this, but why is it important to do this carbon accounting accurately? So with that, I'll pass it on to Dave. Thanks, Alit. Appreciate that introduction to the GHG um, protocol and scope one, two, and three. And as Lilith mentioned, I'm gonna spend a little bit of time talking about, so why does this matter? Because if we, if we go back in time, um, you know, 10, 20 years, right? There, there weren't a lot of discussions. There might've been a few discussions, but now we've got 
entire webinars focused on these activities. Why is that? What's going on? What are some of the drivers behind that? Well, let's, let's talk through that a little bit today. Uh, first off, regardless of the type of organization that you work for, whether it's public or private, whether it's in the education industry or it's government or corporate, doesn't really matter what type of industry you're in, executives are under pressure from multiple carbon accounting challenges. And this pressure continues to mount year over year. Some of these pressures are internal um, and they may be driven by certain activities that are going on within your organization to reduce energy use as an example, or potentially uh, think of new ways to do, do business. But also there are many external uh, pressures that are being placed on executives as well. Those include pressure from the board or from other direct stakeholders, as well as some indirect stakeholders. There may be pressures even being in place, being placed on organizations based on where they're located uh, from particular regions of their country or even their, their national governments as well. There are many different factors that are mounting towards this, this growing pressure that is being felt by executives around the world, and it's just growing on a regular basis. And we wanted to point to a couple of examples of, of where you can see that in, in a really tangible way. So first off, we, even if we go back almost 10 years ago, the European Green Deal, uh, which required sustainability reporting, enacted the, the non-financial reporting directive. And that affected many companies, um, approximately 11,000 companies that needed to start thinking about reporting on sustainability impacts on a regular basis. But what you'll find when you start talking about greenhouse gas reporting and carbon accounting is that we are, we're on a, a playing field that continues to shift. And that is true when it comes to regulations as well. So although there were regulations that were put in place in let's say 2014, even as recent as this year, there are new requirements that not only make those uh, reporting requirements more arduous or, or maybe more detailed, but in addition, they apply to more organizations than they did before. This new set of requirements, the Corporate Sustainability Reporting Directive that was approved, now the estimated impact is that there are going to be about 50,000 companies, almost a five times factor of companies that need to be thinking about this. And not only do they need to be thinking about this as it phases in over the next few years, but their requirements for reporting also include responsibilities to have an audit performed of the sustainability information that they publish. It's not enough to simply say, yes, we've got a good handle on this and here's what we're doing about it. Or here are some numbers that we put together ourselves and we think they're okay. Similar to progressions that have happened in the financial industry to ensure auditability of data and traceability of data, those same types of requirements are being put in place to greenhouse gas accounting and carbon accounting as well. Those are, that's an example from, from Europe. How about from the United States? Well, many of you have probably heard about the SEC, the Security and Exchange Commission's proposed climate-related disclosure rule, which includes a proposal that would require publicly traded organizations of a certain size to report on scope one, scope two, and scope three. As Lilith talked about, scope three is a very broad topic. It involves a lot of upstream impacts. It involves downstream impacts. There's a lot of different things that you need to be tracking and thinking about as part of that. And this proposal would include a responsibility for organizations to report on their carbon impact in the same way that they're reporting on their financial outcomes on a regular basis on, with annual reports, as an example. And this is currently um, in for the proposal stage for implementation in 2024 and beyond. So that's a national government making a rule, but even at a smaller scale, if we look at the state of California, which by all accounts is larger than most developed countries uh, in its own right, there are two new proposals that were, were brought before the legislature this year. And in fact, there's a link here to an article that was written by none other than Nico, who is our moderator today, um, that talk about these two proposals from the California legislature that would require organizations, regardless of whether they are public or private, to report on their their climate risk. So if we look at the first, it includes anyone who has over a billion dollars worth of sales in the state of California. It includes the same types of things we've been talking about, scope one, scope two, and scope three reporting, and no surprise, must be independently verified. 
The second includes even smaller organizations with, with fewer revenues in California, but it also includes the requirement to prepare a climate-related financial risk report. So these requirements are coming. It's not a question of if, it's a question of when. And part of what we want to talk to you about today is how can you prepare? How can you be on this path already so that you do have data that you can trust, that you could consider to be financial grade, carbon accounting data, that you could use for, for this type of reporting and beyond, whether it's driven by internal or external pressures, as an example. The other thing to notice, you may be sitting here saying, well, you know what, we're, we're not that large of an organization. I don't think this is going to apply to us. In reality, you're going to find that even companies without sustainability goals, even if it's not internally motivated, you're going to need to start supporting carbon reporting requirements because of requirements in the supply chain. If one of your upstream partners or downstream partners potentially has a requirement to get data from you at, because you are contributing to their scope three emissions, you may find that even though th these requirements may not apply directly to your organization, your suppliers, your vendors may require this of you as part of a requirement of continuing to do business with them. So this is something that you really need to take seriously. You need to be thinking about, you need to be discussing within your organizations so that you can be prepared, so that you can have an action plan and let it, instead of letting these things just happen to you instead. So with that, I'm gonna turn it back over to Lilith to talk about what are some of these things you can do to really prepare for these changes that we're talking about. Lilith? Yeah, thanks, Dave. I uh, appreciate that. Um, so uh, what can you do to prepare? So one of the things that we uh, realize is there are some uh, organizations that are doing a lot of good work. They have done this for the last 10 years, last 15 years, and they are much more mature in this, in this uh, carbon accounting maturity continuum. And they are either doing some real-time data uh, decarbonization efforts or at least monthly. What we have found is that even annual carbon and ESG reporting is actually a challenge for many, many, many institutions because of relatively, relatively uh, a new aspect of this. And most organizations are down on the bottom left there where even data collection is uh, what they're doing is struggling at it. And that's where really making sure that the data collection is not an arduous process. You're trying to automate it as much as possible and you're trying to collect it in uh, a single uh, database is more important than managing it through spreadsheets. Um, so right here we can see what can you do to prepare is basically leverage and energy and sustainability ERP. So this becomes a single source of truth for you to track and report all your energy and sustainability data all across your organization. Um, one of the biggest things you will see if you look for jobs is there are thousands and thousands of sustainability director jobs out there. And, and, and companies are having difficult time finding qualified candidates to fill those roles because again, A, the field is new, and B, the, um, the, the areas that they will touch is so diverse. They, they don't typically have direct impact on everything that the company does, but they are required to work together with many stakeholders within the company. For example, uh, here we have a few examples of utility consumption. So the person who's responsible for the utility operation, the facility information, so facility operation, transportation, operational data, supplier impacts. So if you can imagine a re reasonable size corporation, you may have 10 different units within your company that are uh, collecting that data in possibly disparate information systems. So utilities may have their own information system facilities has their own transportation and so on and so forth. The, to make it even worse, utilities will talk to you in KBTUs, whereas transportation will talk to you in miles. So the challenge then becomes translating that information that's coming from those specific sector-based information systems into uh, energy and sustainability information. Can you do it all through spreadsheets? Yes, you can. Should you? Probably not, because it will become really person very, very quickly to try to translate uh, from individual systems to what you want to re report on, on what you should have to report on. So what we suggest is we, we suggest utilizing an ERP system to meet your organization's data and reporting needs. And it comes from uh, capturing your information. So whether it is coming from a different uh, other enterprise system that you already have in your organization or you're collecting, you're starting to collect 
uh, new, new types of information, and Dave is going to touch on an example uh, in, in a few slides down. You bring that information and you capture it, and then you allocate it appropriately. Is it scope one? Is it scope two? Is it scope three? So make sure that as the data is coming in from those various uh, sector-based systems, you're allocating it appropriately as it comes in, so you can actually do analysis. And the analysis piece is very important because you want to make sure that the data that's going to eventually get reported, you have high level of confidence in making sure that it is accurate. So either for today, tomorrow, when it gets published in a newspaper or whether an auditor comes back, and wants to make sure that the data that you provided in that report is accurate, you have a high level of confidence. So you're not publishing any reports that uh, is based on unanalyzed data. So analysis is very important. And then finally, the reporting piece. So you want to make sure that after the analysis is done, you're not sitting there and doing a lot, a lot of work to manually put those reports together. So we want to make sure that those are automated for you. So your journey to decarbonization, we're gonna switch gears a little bit here and we're gonna uh, focus on the actual tangible things. So you, you have all these requirements for uh, reporting, but ultimately those reports don't mean anything unless you're actually reducing your carbon impact. So in addition to all the reporting frameworks, all the regulations that they talked about, ultimately you want to take action. The information that you're gathering will help you make this uh, uh, next level jump on how to proceed on your decarbonization path. So here's a very high uh, depiction, just an illustration really, is if you, if you have all the data put together and you have measured your previous year's emission, odds are if you are in a growing business, your emissions are potentially gonna grow along with uh, your business. How do you then take that total emissions that you will uh, have next year and try to start doing your decarbonization journey? Well, my favorite thing, I've come from energy efficiency background, so my favorite thing is the energy efficiency projects. They are not very sexy, we don't give them too much attention, but they are really one of the best things you can do. The famous saying of the last kilowatt hour you did not consume is, the kilowatt hour that never had to be produced, transmitted, or stored ever. So anything you can do to reduce your energy consumption through efficiency projects, that should be your first step. As we move towards uh, uh, making sure that we have uh, satisfied those energy efficiency projects, the next step is electrification. The reason electrification is part of your decarbonization uh, journey is because the grid is becoming greener. More and more grid operators are adding renewable carbon neutral sources of energy into their portfolio to generate the same amount or more of electricity. And that itself by, uh, by, by joining that, uh, by, by leveraging that, you automatically decarbonize your operation because you're using electricity that's coming from um, carbon neutral or carbon efficient sources. Once you have done those two things, you may still have a, a plenty of carbon uh, footprint because of your actions. And that's where you will have to start thinking about the renewables, any per power purchase agreements with a more greener uh, grid, maybe even look at how you can reduce your scope three emissions. And this is where if you have upstream providers providing you material, you may want to go to some other provider that's doing it a little more greener and that's how you're gonna reduce your scope three emissions. If you have partners downstream for transportation and distribution, you may want to choose better partners that are uh, uh, using greener approaches to their distribution stream. So that's how you're gonna reduce that. And in the end, uh, there's always carbon offsets. Uh, just be careful about carbon offsets uh, certification wise and uh, whatnot. So some of them are not truly doing what they claim to do. There's a little bit of greenwashing potential there. So that's why we leave them to the last. Make sure you do everything else first before you go for uh, carbon offsets. So we are very fortunate here that in, in, instead of just showing this illustration and depiction, we have somebody with us that has actually lived this over the last two decades. So I'm gonna uh, turn this over to uh, Matt Sharon and he's gonna talk to us about his real life experience doing a lot of these things uh, at University of New Mexico. Matt, take it away. Thank you, Lillette. 
So just to uh, give everybody a little background, uh, Lobo Energy is a company that is owned wholly by the University of New Mexico. And when this uh, Lobo Energy first um, was created, the University of New Mexico had some problems on campus. One, they had uh, a failing utility infrastructure. We also had um, aging equipment in all the buildings and utility rates were rapidly increasing. And so they created Lobo Energy to help plan for uh, creating a district energy system and doing upgrades within the building. So we helped with the plan and updated the equipment and lines in our district energy system. Uh, the University of New Mexico added two cogeneration units, and this helped with decarbonization by not using our uh, local utility provider, PNM, to create all of our electricity. We create about 14 megawatts of electricity that we send to campuses, which has helped reduce our uh, carbon footprint by 39%. Um, and from the wasted heat that the cogeneration units uh, use, we take that and we make over 240,000 pounds per hour of steam to heat the buildings during the winter time. Uh, we also upgraded our chill water plant. So instead of having individual chillers, and I should say also boilers in every single building, we eliminated that and put it in one central utility plant so that we could uh, help with the maintenance and lower uh, or increase the efficiency of our plant. And then we also help put in a smart metering system. And this smart metering system is measuring almost 95% of all the buildings on Maine and North Campus. Um, from that, then we could actually concentrate on the consumption side of, of sustainability and energy. So measurement and verification is probably the most important part because if you can't measure what's happening in your buildings, you won't know if an energy conservation measure is actually helping or hurting uh, the energy consumed in that building. So we got that in place and the smart metering system helped tremendously with that. Uh, we started retro commissioning, continuous commissioning, all of our HVAC, lighting, buildings um, on a daily basis to make sure that everything was working in accordance to how it was designed. We implemented ASHRAE type one and two audits, which uh, consist of zero to low cost energy conservation measures that we can implement in buildings. Of course, technology upgrades with equipment, with lighting is one of the um, fastest ways to save energy. And it also gives us the tools to be able to capture more low hanging fruit that we can implement in the buildings. Uh, that could be, you know, we add building automation systems. We have 90% of our buildings on main campus and north campus are on some type of, I should say all campuses are on some type of building automation system where we're now lowering the temperature at night when nobody is there and then bringing it back up to make it comfortable for everybody by the time they get to start their work day. And then behavior modification, we have a group of uh, energy conservation specialists that go around the buildings and uh, try to make people aware of all the wasteful behavior that goes on. Um, yes, there's uh, certain lighting sensors and other things that we can implement in the buildings to help with that, but still turning off lights, computers, monitors adds up to nickels and dimes or nickels and dimes add up to a big chunk of energy that we end up saving. So that's kind of where our focus started was on energy and then it's moved to some other big um, accomplishments that the University of New Mexico has succeeded in. We have added, we've added 27 uh, lead buildings on campus. We have over 2000 recycle bins. Uh, we have 500 tons of campus water diverted from landfill each year. Uh, 100 million gallons of savings just from low flow toilets. Uh, we're adding renewable energy whenever we financially can. Um, we have 11 solar power systems across all of our campuses. And we have two community gardens. 
Now, one of the big successes has been that continuous commissioning, the audits, and the behavior modification in the buildings. And this is where Energy Cap has come in extremely useful for the University of New Mexico. So while we did have interval data through smart metering system, there wasn't a really good, easy way to look at the data and figure out where are we using more energy in these buildings compared to previous years. Yes, we had bills, but the way that our old process worked, it just it consumed a lot of time just to get the bills into a system, into our banner system, and then bill out. Well, Energy Cap now takes all of our bills on a monthly day basis, and it's we can bill internal internally to all the different departments, and then it also can create um, different environmental metrics like uh, metric tons, trees removed, CO2 from all the building that you've, or all the building consumption uh, on your campus. So in this case, uh, we are able to, since our program started in 2008, save almost 26% of our total uh, energy consumption. We have an avoided cost, which is close to $140 million since 2008. Now, just to clarify, that's not savings. That's just money that we didn't have to pay to our utility provider because of this, because of the energy conservation measures that we put into place. And we have over 340,000 metric tons of CO2 that we've helped remove uh, from our campus energy. So. These are some of the things that Energy Cap has helped us streamline where it used to take us weeks to put together these kind of numbers. Now it's just a click of a button. So I'll hand it back to you a little bit. Thanks, Matt. Uh, and yeah, that's just an impressive uh, set of numbers that you just shared with us. And uh, you also highlighted that there is not a single silver bullet that uh, we can just uh, say, hey, that's going to solve all our problems. We will have to take a multi-pronged approach to uh, make sure that we tackle this decarbonization behemoth of a problem that we are all facing. Uh, so I really appreciate you sharing that story with us. Um, so all the work is done, but you want to make sure that you can keep focusing on doing this work and not on the clerical data entry uh, piece. So that I'll turn it back over to Dave. He's going to talk a little bit about the energy sustainability ERP solution that Energy Cap provides. Thanks, Lit, and thanks, Matt, for giving those examples. And, and I think you probably heard Matt say multiple times that the Energy Cap products have allowed the University of New Mexico to track this more accurately, more effectively, and have more confidence in their data. And those are all elements of what we're talking about when we talk about this energy and sustainability ERP, the single source of truth for your energy and sustainability data. And at Energy Cap, we provide several different products to help our customers along this decarbonization journey. And it, these products allow them to start in different places. So as an example, we look at the Carbon Hub product that, that we're going to be talking about the most today, and that's our financial grade greenhouse gas accounting system. So you may be collecting information from multiple different sources, but we're, we have provided a product that allows you to effectively track and report on your emissions data with high quality, with confidence that can stand up to audits. That's Carbon Hub. Our energy cap product though goes beyond that and allows you to record that information through information you're collecting from utility bills. And it also allows you to provide this portfolio level energy and sustainability reporting. And this is the product that primarily Matt was talking about when he referred to the ways the University of New Mexico has been tracking and reporting on energy savings over time. So this product allows you to look holistically across all of your facilities, across your operations, be able to get a good handle of of how you are currently performing, improvements that you're making, as well as identifying opportunities for savings, whether those are at the individual utility bill level or if they're at the building level or maybe the portfolio level. And then finally, we also provide our Wattex product. And our Wattex product allows our customers to have real-time energy and sustainability analytics. This allows our customers to dive directly into the buildings and look at the information that, that's going on in real time. It allows them to look at 
individual loads on systems. It allows them to look at trends day over day, week over week, month over month. It provides automatic load shaping and analysis. But beyond that, it also includes the ability to be alerted when things don't add up, when things aren't matching historic behaviors, when, when particular, particular usage patterns cross boundaries that you've set as trigger points. Why is that important? Because all of us are getting more and more data. None of us are getting less data on a regular basis, right? So Wadex allows you to take that information and be notified when something deserves your attention rather than you scrambling every day to, to take a look at what's going on. And if we wanna make these measurable steps towards decarbonization, we need to understand where the opportunities are. Energy Cap can help with that. We also need to be able to drill in and look in particular facilities and be able to identify particular behaviors and as soon as possible to avoid as much waste as possible. Because as Lip mentioned before, we can avoid those problems to begin with. We never have to make up for them by some other activity. So whether you're looking at Carbon Hub or Energy Cap or Wadex, these products can be used independently, but when you bring them together, you get this multiplier effect of being able to share data across systems and be able to have both a broad as well as a very narrow focus of what's going on with your energy and sustainability data. Of note, the University of New Mexico has been using some of our tool set for a while, but Matt and the team are looking for new and different ways to use this going forward to continue to enable their decarbonization journey. Matt, would you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, so, you know, some of our decarbonization goals will need to, we'll need to focus on more data collection, right? I talked about what we've done for pretty much our scope one and scope two, but we don't really have anything to collect and store data for scope three emissions. And that's where Carbon Hub is gonna become extremely useful and we're really excited about it. And not only is it somewhere to store it, but now we can actually put in processes of collecting that data and making it easier for everybody else. And one of the best things about Carbon Hub and Wadex and ECAP in general is that you can have a limited amount of users. So we can give parking and transportation, right? Their own username and they can get in and update it. We can give it also to our sustainability uh, office or residence halls. And now they can put in the rows, they can track it and they can brag about what they're doing on their own without even uh, me knowing about it, right? So that's one of the great things I think that um, this kind of package is doing. And then also the Wadex is gonna help speed up our, uh, um, our measurement and verification process. So right now we're doing it pretty much on a monthly basis where we compare this month compared to the same time last month or last year compared to our baseline year, which is for us in 2008 when we started with energy cap. But now with Wadex, we're gonna be able to, on a nightly basis, download our data into Wadex and it's gonna tell us whether the energy is out of a threshold or not. So if it's above a threshold, then our energy specialists will go out there and try to see what happened in that building. Are we not doing schedules? Is Do we have two valves open at the same time, a chill water and a steam valve? And we'll be able to fix the problem a lot quicker by using Wadex. Um, so and not to mention, we'll get emails when there is something out of a threshold, right, or over our baseline we'll be able to track what our energy conservation specialists are doing to resolve that issue. And they'll be able to put a note in, in that area saying, hey, this is what happened during this time and it got fixed at this time, right? Not to mention there's a ton of other cool metrics from uh, predicting your um, costs for the future, putting in energy conservation measures and seeing how it affects your data um, so I'm really excited about what all the possibilities are for with Carbon Hub and with Wadex. And like Dave said, now it's all in one platform. So all we have to do is put our utility data into Energy Cap and all three platforms will be updated with instantaneous reports. So we're gonna use that then and create our sustainability plan. We're right now in the middle of uh, creating a five-year plan um, and within that sustainability plan, obviously you need to focus on utilities. Do we need to go, how carbon free do we need to go? You know, are, 
local utility provider is supposed to be carbon free by 2040. Do we let them help with a lot of the work and we kind of piggyback on them or how do we become more flexible also with creating our own carbon free strategy and being able to switch between different types of uh, energy sources, right? And then most importantly, um, going back to what energy cap and Wadix and Carbon Hub can do, we need to take this data and whatever metrics set we have success stories with and bring it to the community, right? You know, it's people don't, uh, they're always gonna assume you're not doing anything unless you put it right in their face and say, this is what we're doing. And energy cap Wadix and Carbon Hub is gonna allow us to put this into a marketing plan to show our community um, that we are focused on sustainability and we have it as one of our core values that we wanna move forward with in the future. Thanks, Matt. Uh, appreciate you giving us that overview and kind of that peek into the future. And, and again, if you, if you listen to a number of the things that Matt mentioned, it's really about technology helping to enable their team because it gives them more and more time to focus on where they can make an impact instead of scrambling to put data together or try to try to go find all this information on their own. And that's where these products really do work together and share data well to be able to provide that. And we're excited to walk with the University of New Mexico on that particular journey. Before we transition over to Q&A, what we wanted to do was just give you a, a peek at what do, what do these tools look like? And in particular, when we talk about carbon and being able to, to provide your data or track your information in a financial grade carbon accounting package, what does that look like? Um, and we wanted to show a little bit of that with our Carbon Hub examples here today. So we're talking about tracking, as Lilit mentioned before, scope one, two, and three emissions. And there's different sources of that information. One is that your utility bills are a great source of information. That'll give you a good handle on much of your scope one and scope two information, whether you're tracking that individually or maybe even you just wanna upload a total usage value for the entire year. Carbon Hub can take either one, translate that into, into carbon emissions, into GHG factor data. You can also map supply chain information and other data that you're collecting from suppliers, from people you're purchasing from, from employees with commuting data, et cetera. You can also translate all of that into scope three information. And Carbon Hub includes many of the built-in factors that you're gonna need to do that type of translation. And speaking from personal experience, that's where a lot of time is being invested by many people right now who are trying to, to get a handle of all these different factors. We're trying to simplify that by bringing that information together and bringing in information from the United States and around the world. So we have published EPA and IPCC values for raw fuels. We have EPA e-grid values and IEA electricity factors, which cover the United States and North America and globally. We also have other published scope three factors from the EPA and from DEFRA in the UK and from EcoInvent, which also covers you know, globally manufacturing and other scope three emissions. That's a service that we provide as part of this so that you can focus on what your organization is doing. We can help you with that part of being confident in the numbers that are being produced on the other side of that. And there are lots of different factors and things that you could also map yourself if you have custom power purchase agreements or custom fuel mixes or custom uh, supply chain emissions information. Carbon Hub supports all of that as well as all those standard factors that I mentioned before. And when we're talking about scope one data, as we talked about before, one of the best ways to use to collect that is with direct billing data. And the combination of Energy Cap and Carbon Hub work really well together in this realm, but you can also enter this information directly into Carbon Hub directly. Scope two, electricity is the main source of scope two. Yes, there are other district energy suppliers, but this tends to be the, the top for scope two. Um, we support both location-based reporting, which allows you to take information for what you're using at your facility, regardless of what type of power purchase agreements or other financial instruments you're using to, to financially reduce your carbon. We can track the location-based reporting. We can also track any of those offsets or renewable energy credits separately. So you can see both values next to each other. So you can do full location-based reporting you can track the RECs and the offsets, and then you can combine them together to produce that market-based reporting, which means what did I use minus 
whatever adjustments I made because I, I decided as an organization to reduce my carbon through some type of a financial transaction like a renewable energy credit. When it comes to scope three, scope three is arguably a lot more complex because the data comes from so many different sources. And it's important to note that there, there are many different ways that you can track scope three. Some are less precise than others, starting at the bottom with using spend information to translate into GHG reporting values, all the way up to the top where you have the actual detailed GHG values that a supplier or vendor gives you. And they say, this is your exact carbon information associated with your activities. There's a full spectrum there. And it's important to note that not all data types require the same level of detail. And that's something your organization is going to have to work through is what information is critical to have at that, that highest, um, most granular level. What areas can I maybe go down and use something close, closer to a cost-based analysis? That's where factors like the factors from the EPA and DEFRA and ECO and Ben can really be helpful in that mapping. The GHG protocol provides guidance for capturing your scope three information. So we recommend that you go there. We, we provided a link here so that you can see where some of that information is posted. And we also want you to recognize that Carbon Hub can accommodate all of those scenarios, whether you're doing cost-based or you're doing the fine grain information provided from a particular vendor or supplier. There are tables and information available to do translation, especially from cost into GHG. That's something that many people aren't aware of when they first get started with scope three emissions. That's something that's really important. And like I said, tracking down those, those figures can be a little challenging at times. So that's why we provide that as a service to our customers. You can also use volume, distance, weight, You've probably seen information that you've you've seen on websites when you're purchasing flights or you're booking hotel rooms that you can also use to track scope three emissions related to business travel. Um, employee commuting is another example of that as well. And we've got factors to help you with tracking that type of information across your, your organization. And once you have that together, it's really important to be able to tell that story. So we want to integrate that together to give you that holistic view that shows your scope one, scope two, scope three emissions by location, by particular business type, to be able to do accurate reporting, easy reporting, um, it's your data. And you wanna make sure that whatever tool you're using to track it, you can easily get that information out. And that's why we've worked really hard to provide a number of different options to help our customers present the data in a way that's meaningful for them to save them lots of time, like Matt talked about earlier today. So with that uh, overview of, of uh, Carbon Hub, I'm gonna turn it back over um, to Nico to walk us through the Q&A time that we have together today. Thank you. That was a lot of information, but very helpful information. Um, we'll now transition into our Q&A. I see that a lot of people have already begun putting their questions in the chat. So thank you. We will be getting through those. Um, I will start off with the first question, which is, um, does this system allow you to report to multiple different standards and frameworks? And will that continue um, to expand if there are new regulations, such as state regulations that go into place? Yeah, that's I, I can take oh, that ahead, one, Dave. Uh, if you want to, go ahead. It's all you. All right. <laughs> so yeah, that's a great question, Nico. We, we've looked at many of the requirements uh, that are either in place or that are coming down the pike every six months, it seems like now. And what we are focusing right now is figuring out a way to easily capture all the data. That way, uh, you don't have to worry about that piece to, to then allocate it and then analyze it when, when it comes to reporting piece, since these frameworks are still in a, in a little bit of a fray, we are holding off on creating automation to push data to those frameworks. But within the tool, we make it very easy for you to extract the data in the raw format, then you can slice and dice it for whatever framework it applies to. As time goes on, as these uh, frameworks do mature, our plan is to make sure in future, um, make it available for our customers to export the data to a specific framework format, and then they'll be able to easily publish it. Okay, thank you for clarifying that. Another question uh, is, how do you define financial grade emissions data? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. And what I would do is draw a parallel from the financial realm, right? So when we think about 
you know, the type of data that stands up to an audit. That's not data that's typically written down on pieces of paper, and it's often not things that would be scattered around in multiple places. It would be the same quality of data that you could take to an auditor and say, here's my information, and I can stand behind this. And when we talk about that financial grade carbon accounting data, that means you can track it from source. Where did I get this information? Through the pipeline, through the conversion of GHG factors, which by the way, change over time. So that's another complexity of this, to be able to get to the final reporting outcome. That's really important to be able to track from edge to edge. And that's where a system like Carbon Hub can be really helpful because not only do we provide auditing abilities to see who entered the data, where did it come from? We also show you the full history of how that data was transformed through GHG factors to get to the final results. and. Our tools have things like security permissions, traceability, um, audit reporting. And in fact, many of our customers use those features today from a financial perspective to even give auditors read-only access to the system to say, here, here, go take a look. This is exactly how I'm tracking my energy and financial data. In a similar vein, we're providing that level of financial grade accounting through Carbon Hub. So it's that type of, of data that can stand up to the test of an audit by a third party, and they can trust that from source to final reporting, they can see every step along the way, who touched the data, and they have confidence that you're doing it accurately on the other side. Thank you for that answer. And you answered, um, there were a few questions about the auditability of the data, and I think you covered those as well. So uh, I will skip over those. Um, Another question is, does your team offer assistance to clients in their emissions accounting when they sign up for the tool or is it intended to be self-managed? Yeah, our goal is to provide tools that are intuitive enough that you can use them yourself without a lot of handholding. We are not, just to be really clear, we are not a consulting company. There are a lot of consulting companies out there. Our plan is to provide software that enables you and empowers you to be able to go do it on your own. And that doesn't mean that we leave you on your own. We have lots of help materials and help guides and videos and things like that. And But once once you get started, the idea is that you can maintain that over time. And again, I'll point to, to Matt and the University of New Mexico is a great example where you know, initially we helped them with the, the very beginning, getting up and running, but then for years now, they have been off and running on their own, managing, adding, configuring, changing, and uh, we're excited to see what they're going to do with Carbon Hub. So that's not a primary goal of ours is to be that consultant. It's instead to provide intuitive software and to provide you with the guidance that allows you to step through the process very easily and in a cost effective manner. Thank you for that. And then moving on to another question, how much of the data capture is automated and how much requires some form of input or upload or a manual process? Um, I can take that one, Dave. Um, so it, it depends on your organization and the other systems that you're using. Uh, some uh, systems that are more advanced that can exchange data more automated, we would encourage you to go on a spectrum of fully manual to fully automated as close to fully automated as possible. Realizing that not all other systems that you're trying to extract data from will be able to serve that, the software has immense amounts of flexibility to go from that fully automated to either semi-automated or completely manual if, you're, if your journey is just starting in the uh, sustainability reporting uh, paradigm, then you may be collecting data manually. So we, we, we understand that our customers may be coming from different levels of maturity and we make it available to you in many shape or form. But if we are asked what should you be doing, we recommend going as automated as possible. Thank you for that. When a Matt, corporation- Matt, did you have a comment with that? Yeah, Sorry, I, just, I just wanted to, you know, one of the things we used to do is at the University of New Mexico is uh, hand and put everything in, right? And, you know, obviously we've had energy cap for 15 years and since then, now we take our interval data and we put it on an FTP site every night and ECAP grabs that data and puts it in the system for us. So that's been an automated uh, way of collecting our data. And we also use their bill capture service for all of our off-site campuses that are connected to our local utility providers. So they, we scan, you don't have to do it this way. They can actually go in and, and grab the data for you, but we scan our bills, we send it to 
energy cap and they just put it right in uh, to the system automatically. So that just, it can be as easy as a bill import process, or you can put a lot of work into just setting it up. So you really only have to click a button and then your monthly data is calculated. Thank you for sharing that example. You, you can take it to a whole different level. Uh, Carbon Hub, Energy Cap, Vortex, they're all built on API platforms. So if you have a desire to make it even more real time, not even just a batch nightly upload, you can actually uh, work with us. Either you have the team that can write the software, we publish our API uh, on our websites. You can uh, either push data to us or pull data from our platform. So you can make it even more automated down to the hour, 15 minute level. And the platform supports uh, doing that. The example that uh, Matt gave about utility data, think about from a, a, a business travel scope three data. So if you are capturing your company's business travel, you can tie it to your accounting system that's probably capturing the data and you can bring it in through uh, nightly batches or uh, real time API pushes or monthly pushes, whatever is comfortable for your organization, you can bring that data in whatever grant account. Thank you, and I think we have time for just one more question. So this question is, when a corporation realizes they need to hedge against their carbon footprint, what functional department is tasked with this work? So perhaps which, um, which role or which function is usually reaching out to Energy Cap to start working on this kind of work? It's a great question. I, I wish I could tell you that it's only one, but the reality is it's not. Um, different organizations have tasked different teams and different leaders with this role uh, or with this responsibility. In some cases, there are organizations that are um, maybe a little bit more progressive and they already have a sustainability team. And then often it's that sustainability team that's reaching out and saying, how can we use the tools that are available to really facilitate what we're doing? In other cases, we have folks who are, uh, they might be the lone wolf that they, they've just been tasked, hey, I, I want you to go uh, take this on. And that could be somebody that's in the, the energy group or the facility group. It could be somebody in the accounting or finance team. In fact, that's, that often ends, ends up being a place that people go because they associate um, the idea of financial reporting and sustainability reporting together because, okay, these are, these are annual reports. We've got a group that does a lot of that. Maybe they should be responsible. And that's where we, we end up with a number of people who, who come to us and say, I, where do I get started? And that goes back to what we said before about really trying to provide the tools and the direction so that you can really go from, from zero to 60 as quick as you, as you want in terms of, of that reporting. And, and the last comment I would make with that is, you know, we've talked about a number of different things and realize Matt and his team, as he mentioned, they have a long history of getting into this. You might be early on just starting. Don't get overwhelmed. Don't get overwhelmed and think this is too big. I, if I don't have it all, I can't do any of it. You can start small. You can start with the data that you have and then grow that data and grow that as you continue to get buy-in and as you continue to tell, tell your story. So don't be overwhelmed and say, I, I, it's just too big for me. You can start small and you can grow into it over time. Thank you for that. And with that, that is all the time that we have today. I want to thank our speakers for this informative conversation and thank my colleague behind the scenes, Taylor Flores, for making everything run so smoothly. If you would like to rewatch this webcast, the recording will be archived on greenbiz.com and our team will email you the link once it's available later today. You can also check out the resources on this topic um, by clicking on the button on your screen. This includes a link to Energy Cap Carbon Hub website, the webcast slides, a link to subscribe to Green Biz Group's Greenfin Weekly Newsletter, which explores ESG and sustainable finance news and trends. And tomorrow morning's article actually covers why all companies need to be pursuing um, their Scope 3 emissions reporting. And then also a link to register for Greenfin 23, the premier sustainable finance and investing event happening from June 26th through the 28th in Boston, Massachusetts. Lastly, if you'd like to watch more Green Biz webcasts, please visit www.greenbiz.com slash webcasts. And on behalf of my colleagues at Green Biz and our speakers today, 
Thank you so much for joining us. I'm Nico McCrossin. Until next time, have a wonderful day.